So I'm sitting here with Lynn from Dallas, Texas, Lynn Strawn, Davenport, and um, I connected with you, Lynn, because of uh, a mutual friend of ours, Allison Haver McDowell. And, um, you know, you have kind of an interesting story yourself and how you ended up connecting with Allison. Mm -hmm. You want to tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, I live in Dallas and grew up there. I used to be an IT recruiter. I worked for Arthur Anderson and also worked in the telecom industry. And then I quit to, to stay home with my kids. So I have three kids. I have two who are in college and one who's still in high school. And uh, yes, yeah, so Allison and I connected several years ago. I think it was maybe around 2016. And we, we did a, a podcast with a friend, a mutual friend of ours, Alice Linehan, who's an education researcher and activist. And so we were on this podcast and it was about artificial intelligence, education technology, and uh, just we, we had all seen the same things in our, in our school districts. And Allison is in Philly and Alice Linehan and I are in Texas and in two different school districts. And we started seeing this, uh, we, we had issues with the testing industry and what it was doing to the curriculum and to the kids. But we all were seeing similar things uh, going on in the schools. And so we connected through Facebook and then did this podcast. And the podcast was exposing uh, what was going on with education technology and how it was coming into the schools. And people didn't really understand what was happening with the data and the, the predictive analytics. And, and so we just became fast friends. And, and then that morphed into other things. So we were also researching things going on in the cities, like smart city surveillance and predictive policing, uh, things going on in the legislature and bills that we were seeing in Philly, she was seeing in Philly and I would see in Texas. And, and uh, just understanding uh, there was more going on than just what we were seeing in education. And I have to ask, mm -hmm. Arthur Anderson, you worked for Arthur Anderson. That's really mm -hmm. interesting. What, would, what were you doing for Arthur Anderson? Well, so I was a recruiter for their business consulting division. So all their technology people, their consultants, I would recruit them uh, and then they would go out to different clients. But Anderson, as you know, imploded during the Enron scandal. And what's interesting about that is then fast forward uh, years ago with the Enron scandal, then uh, billionaire John Arnold made out with, you know, billions. Uh, and I think he was about 30, 30 something years old when he left. And he then went on to influence what was happening in Dallas ISD. My kids are in Richardson ISD, even though I live in Dallas, it's a different district, but I follow what's going on in Dallas ISD. So John Enron, I mean, John uh, uh, Arnold, from Enron was donate. He donated money to this. This they called it the Dallas Home Rule Charter campaign, and that was where the mayor would work with this. The, the mayor was working with uh, people be behind the scenes to take over the school board. So it's mayoral control of a school board. So you know he can't even figure out how to. He couldn't figure out how to fix homeless homelessness potholes. Uh, crime. He couldn't solve any of those things, but he's going to tell us what to do with our our school districts. And so that thing that failed, but it ended up going that the the trustee he was working with, Mike Morath, on the Dallas ISD school board, ended up being appointed by our current governor of Texas, Governor Greg Abbott, appointed Mike Morath to the Texas Education Agency. So now. And so when that thing failed, he then turned it into a house bill that uh, is now being used to take over some of the school districts. So they use the accountability system, the testing, the test scores, and all you have to have is one failing school dis or uh, one failing school within a district, and they can take over the district. So that's happening to Houston right now. So. What was it that kind of started you in your, I don't know if you want to call it activism, but kind of looking into, you know, mm -hmm. questioning some of these things as opposed to just going about your life? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, for, I, for me, it was uh, my then third grader, and he's now an 11th grader, but he was completely, he was just, for lack of a better term, he was wigging out over the 
testing, the STAR test is what we call it, S-T-A-A-R. That's our standardized test in Texas. And at the time it was provided or our testing vendor was Pearson, you know, the international testing company. And so he was, stra he would come home crying and he was a totally normal, typical kid, very, you know, happy-go-lucky third kid. And I had the older two, so I knew what was normal. And he was just completely stressed over the test. He had no risk of failing it, but he didn't know that. And so the teacher was telling them, if you don't pass this, then you will not be promoted to the next grade. Well, no kid wants to be left in the last grade, you know, not, not go up with their peers. And so they're not supposed to do that. And then I found my daughter's teacher was doing the same thing, just saying, you know, if you don't pass, then you're going to be you know, left behind. And so I started paying attention to what was going on with the testing and who was funding it and why the schools were so much worse. From the older child to the younger child, it had gotten progressively worse. And our school, at the time it was a Title I school when I put my kids in there, but kind of gentrification and a lot of, a lot of changes had happened. The school was not at risk at, at failing. But um, there was still just this crazy testing culture, lockdowns where you have to eat your lunch in your room, you can't, you know, to, get it, to go to the bathroom, you have to have, I mean, it was just crazy. And then if you're done with the test, then you have to sit there. You just, sit, you could be sitting there for hours. Uh, no, you're not allowed to have a book or anything. It was just crazy, crazy, stupid controls. And the teachers were all just like, you know, white knuckling it and everybody was stressed out and it became more like the, you know, um, a prison during testing and uh, so I just started fighting that and I went before my school board and said I think that you should shadow a third grader and you should see what these kids are going through but that just led me down a whole you know the whole rabbit trail of you know who's funding what and why we have all this crap in our schools in the first place which is a total perversion of education and it's it's educational malpractice is what I say not good for kids so you you started to question you know what was going on with your with your kids testing mm -hmm. and their their school experience where did that lead you well then i realized my school board they were a rubber stamping board i started watching the video the not the videos but showing up to the school board meetings and realizing they vote in lockstep and i thought i wonder if they if anyone's ever voted no on anything so I filed to run in 2017, I filed to run for a seat on the school board and uh, I ran against uh, an incumbent and I, there was an open seat and then there was the incumbent seat and I, I could have run in the open seat, that probably would have been a little easier, uh, but I didn't want to do that. I want, if I was going to do it, I wanted to bump off somebody who should not be on there in the first place. And, and on paper, I mean, she looked great. But judging by her voting record, she was basically a rubber stamper. And uh, so I did this deep dive on their votes while I was running for the board. And I found out that of 445 or so, or 444, uh, there, there was only one no vote in six years. And that's as far back as I went. So there's no telling how many. So basically, they would... Behind the scenes, they would meet and they would have these preordained outcomes. I mean, they would, they, they already had it determined before the meeting began and they're not supposed to do that. It's a violation of Texas Open Meetings Act. And so they were deciding before they ever got to the horseshoe, you know, yes, yes, no discussion, yes. And so I thought, well, what, what good are these elected people if they're just like little puppets just sitting there? And they would say, oh no, that's not how it works. I got reprimanded by even city people saying, that's not how it works. That's not, no, we want to have consensus. And, you know, it's for the, is there a fly? There was a little fly. <laughs> Pulling a Mike Pence. Uh, the, so, the, you know, it's not, that's not how it goes. And um, there's, um, you know, we have to build consensus and get along and all these things. And I'm thinking, no, actually, I want to see what, what you're hashing out behind the scenes. I want to know, I want that all done above board. And so, you know, people like me, it's, they don't want people like me on the school board because I'm going to follow the money. I'm going to question their decisions. I'm going to have it done all. I love transparency. I want to know what's really going on. We don't need the, we don't, we don't need rainbows and sunshine. I mean, they've literally said kumbaya at the, this, at the horseshoe. <laughs> kumbaya. And I'm like, no, we don't want kumbaya. Some people do. I mean, that's why we get what we In elect. Boulder, it's namaste. Nama, namaste. Yes. 
So, so I, I won. I mean, I, I, I won. I didn't win. I lost. I after I ran, um, I got forty-seven percent of the votes. She won, and um, but I, I didn't stop there because it really wasn't about. I mean, I can do a lot more actually not being on the board, but I thought it was important to have somebody who was going to really scrutinize every contract, every memorandum of understanding, someone to ask questions, not, you know, how are our kids learning? What are they learning? Who's profiting off the professional development and in the curriculum? And those are questions our board should be asking and they're not, they're still not asking that. Um, so there's still, and our district got sued. There was a double lawsuit. They spent about almost a half a million dollars trying to fight the um, the former trustee. We only one black trustee has ever served on the board, and he filed a lawsuit. And one was an open meetings violation. The other was that uh, we were an at-large district, not single member. So that's part of the problem with the rubber stamping because there's no, the single member districts, each trustee would represent their particular area in the district. We didn't have that. So they lost that, uh, they actually settled, they didn't lose. But they used the, the TOMA, the open meetings violation where they were taking trustees out two by two. And uh, then they'd say, okay, here's how we're gonna vote. And then they go back in. And so that's a complete violation of the law. So they used that in order to to uh, push them to settle for the other suit. So it was actually brilliant on the lawyer's part. And uh, so none of that ever became public. We, we never had access to what was going on in the depositions. I was hoping that would come out, but it did not. So um, back to the, the, the woman I ran against works for a public-private partnership funded by Gates, Bill Gates. And so I've had um, years of uh, researching Bill Gates and just figuring out how he's using grants to dangle the money carrot to get us to do whatever it is he wants us to do in the schools. And so it's a conduit. He uses Educate Texas and this Communities Foundation of Texas, which is where she works. And uh, that money is um, used to roll out all kinds of agendas. It's a conduit. Emphasis on con. Can do it, yeah. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. Yeah, so I've seen that a lot with these these um, city councils and these boards, where it's you know you have this whole community of people come in and protest or trying to raise their voice around a certain issue, and and you're looking at these people that are sitting on the board and they're like playing like games on their phone and they're just bored and. And it just it just seems like a total fraud. And I think that what you're talking about is like standard procedure, like all across the country. Because I can't even tell you how many times yeah. I've seen, um, you know, them just it's every once in a while there'll be like one or two like real people on the boards, but they're always they've always got the the you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you you got the people that gets they the part of the education ecosystem. They want their people on the board. So they will fund their campaigns and through PACs and, and um, donations. The, but I actually raised more money than my opponent, but uh, you, know, you really can't go up against that education machine if they decide that they don't want you on there. It's very difficult to do that. The, you, know, the, you also have people who, you mentioned you know, they're on their phones, they're not really paying attention to what you're saying. The public testimony comes and they're like, okay, now I can check out and get on my phone. Uh, I don't really go before the board to necessarily enlighten them. Uh, I use it to, I clip out my three minutes and then I share it with my, with those who have been following, you know, my advocacy. And so it's a way to reach people he wouldn't normally reach who won't show up to school board meetings, but they'll watch a three minute video. And, the, and if they, they're engaged and they're, uh, they've got kids in the system, they'll watch it. And I've testified, I mean, I've gone to talk uh, about reading and our crappy reading scores uh, that, you know, they do, a, they talk a big game about equity and diversity and inclusion. And they, I find that they're, it's fakeity. It's these empty platitudes if they really cared about equity, diversity, and inclusion, then they would care about how kids are reading in all of our schools. And I've found that the, the schools that are, are, have the lowest reading scores and are the most impoverished have the least amount of resources. We actually spend more money in our more affluent campuses than we do 
in our campuses with low SES um, kids in them. So how is that equitable? But then they hire a diversity, you know, an equity, uh, you know, somebody, you know, in the administration who's supposed to be over equity, and it's all, like I said, empty, empty platitudes. And they do this at the city too. It's all complete bullshit. So at the end of the day, I need to stop saying that. Yeah, my husband's like, at the end of the day. I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I didn't used to say that. I don't know why I suddenly started saying that. Also, I, well, I, we I'm are sure. at the end of the day. It's so because it is the, the eleventh. It's at the eleventh hour here. We're this so is so technically. You this can say is it. two minutes to midnight. Um, yeah. But oh, so so oh, what we right. have here. <laughs> So what we have here is just a small group of people that are basically taking over. I mean, essentially, yeah. I mean, we, you hear people talk about the oligarchy or the elites or these technocrats. But when you look at, so let's take Bill Gates, for example. So he's been donated, he's donated six million to the PTA, he donated to the Texas Education Agency through Educate Texas. And um, he was involved in you know, Common Core and testing and all of that even teacher merit pay. So Gates now, fast forward, we've got a pandemic. He invested $650 million in Crown Castle, which is a, that's a 5G company that installs all these, these smaller wireless networks all over the place and these, these massive um, towers, these cell towers. So he invests in Crown Castle, $650 million. That was, in la that was last year, 2019. The pandemic hits. Our kids are all sheltered at home. They've got their devices. They need Wi-Fi hotspots. Who did my district and Dallas ISD contract for those hotspots? Crown Castle. So Crown Castle, I mean, you know, I've said this before on, on other interviews. Is he Nostradamus? Does he have these predictive, you know, these, is he a prophet that you predict all these things? Or did he know this stuff was coming? I don't know. I mean, who knows? I mean, we, you've, heard, you've seen the thing about Event 201 and, and those who talk about this pandemic before it actually hit and a virus, you know, this big virus, and then it hits and he's right there ready to give our kids, you know, Wi-Fi access. Yeah, Event 201 was in no, last November and it was a, uh, a scenario uh, a drill mm -hmm. for a coronavirus. Mm, a coronavirus, yeah. So, you know, when people talk about the pandemic or, you know, that this is all, you know, just, you know, they'll say, oh, it's a hoax. I don't know if it's a hoax or not. I mean, I know there's a virus, but uh, was it, you know, manufactured or released or on purpose as a, a drill, a, a test run or something for something bigger? Anything is possible. I mean, um, but when you're talking about these big tech giants who are manipulating us at every level with the money that they distribute and they want a desire, they have a desired outcome. Uh, a lot of them are involved in ed tech and education and they're also involved in in these smart cities agendas, which is complete surveillance everywhere. And all of the, you know, the internet of things, everything will, will connect with each other and, and we'll talk, all these devices will talk to each other and they'll be able to do predictive profiling on people and even predictive policing on people. Um, you know, it's something that we should be paying attention to because a, a small number of, of men could be controlling everything from education to our election outcomes. So like right now, there's something I'm battling in the city of Dallas. So we have a $15 million grant that just came to us September 10th, our elections uh, office, this woman who, she's actually been terminated, but she gets to work through the end of the uh, end of November. That's convenient, but uh, she was actually inept in her job and the March primaries were terrible and there's lots of voter you know issues with the machines so she she applied for this 15 million dollar grant from facebook and zuckerberg and google and, and rockefeller and all these are are uh, are contributing to this it's called uh the center for tech and civic life so ctcl is the one who's giving this grant that our elections person applied for and so we got it, and now it goes through the commissioner's court. So I, I was the only, I was one of two speakers speaking against this. 
and 800,000 of it was being used to to uh, do some sort of voter, what do they call it, voter, um, voter education. Okay, so all these people have registered to vote. I mean, hello, it's almost time to, I mean, the election's done in a few weeks, and we're supposed to be educating voters, but it was targeting certain zip codes. It was a way to manipulate the outcome of the election, and this, these are the big tech, um, you know, people that are funding this. And so, I mean, all of this stuff is, you know, politics is local. A lot of these bad decisions are made locally, and so we really have to pay attention to the agendas and the the all of the agreements, the public-private partnerships, even the nonprofits. I've, I always say, you know, if it's free, you are the product. And a lot of these things, I'll say, oh, it's no cost to the city. I mean, we don't. There's there's no money, you know. But they'll they'll take the money, but they have to do whatever is agree is agreed to in the MOU. They give up their power. Yes. Essentially, and so they do, like there was something called the North Texas Innovation Alliance. Well, it was like, oh, it's, it's no cost to us. Yeah, but when you are, they have access to data, they want something in return. It's not just out of the goodness of their heart. They're creating these regional plans and the smart cities agenda ties in with these regional plans. The same people are pushing the smart cities are also pushing these alliances. So they want to set up with the surrounding cities. It's the same thing going on in education. So you have the the people who are taking all of these independent school districts, like um, there's a, a nonprofit called Commit. Commit is part of the Strive Together network from Cincinnati. And it's a collective impact is what they call it. Um, organization of nonprofit, it's a nonprofit. So they have a data sharing agreement with all these independent school districts around the Metroplex, around Dallas and the surrounding cities. And so they have access to private, personally identifiable information that we hand over freely, freely to a nonprofit run by a former Goldman Sachs executive who doesn't have a background in education. His background's in real estate. Well, why do we give him access to student data? So then he also has an agreement with the Texas Education Agency to do this whole predictive analytics, uh, machine learning. They've, they have access to 16 million student data records and they're doing something with Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, and, a, and an organization called DataKind. What do they want with the student test scores and student data? I don't know, but I think it's some sort of predictive analytics to... Um, to feed into an impact investing uh, scheme, which is like a pay for success model. So someone that's watching this that doesn't know what impact investing is and pay mm -hmm. for success, uh, what is that? Well, you know, you'd mentioned Allison McDowell before, and, and she and I, I mean, she's, I would say she's an expert on this and as far as her research on exposing the, the impact investing, the global impact investing network, what it looks like at the local level with social impact bonds and pay for success models. Uh, so you have these smart contracts that are the, the that'll ha you'll have between a governmental entity, a school district, a municipality, city, and then um, these investors. And um, so, for example, at the Texas Education Agency, our commissioner that I'd mentioned earlier, Mike Morath, uh, he had. Uh, pitched before the House and Senate, there were two different bills, a uh, pay for success bill, a social impact bond bill, where you would have, in, you'd have investors who would uh, invest in a math software program, and essentially they would make money on kids' math scores. It sets up a pay for success model, and uh, that means that if the model works, if education works, if this program works, then investors actually get a return. So it turns kids into little commodities. They're investment vehicles for profit. So I want to come back to the COVID thing because, you know, when you talk to someone about COVID, I don't think you can detach it from some of these other things that are going on. No. So what COVID does, or what it has been... Uh, it's like all these things that we've been seeing in education and in the cities, it is expediting and um, moving things faster. The things that we've been finding, whether it's education technology, it's now, now we're forced on devices. And so all of the things that we've been battling seem to be catapulted into um, 
motion. Well, and everything from, you know, contact tracing to surveillance to, you know, all these things that they had plans for and they said, we would like to do this. Now they say, oh, we have to do this now. Look at this. We have to do this. Right. It could just be luck that, that this just happened in their favor. Or, I mean, we look at the amount of wealth that uh, the, the billionaires have, have grown since this. And then, of course, the CARES Act, which just happened to be like, hey, we just got this act that's just right here. You know, like, let's just do this. Yeah. Uh, largest transfer of wealth in, I believe, human history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also there's the TRACE Act, which is testing, reaching, and contacting everyone act it's hr 6666 and i haven't tracked where it is right now in the the process but i know that um you know the name alone is disturbing (laughs) and that was all before COVID hit and so then you it's like all these things the groundwork was laid and so then all they just needed a a a terrible pandemic Uh, it's like the perfect crisis in order to usher in all of the things that we've been, that we, and I say we, because there, we have a network of, of people across the country. It's not an official network. I mean, we're just moms and dads that are following these things and, and see that this is not good for kids. It's not good for our cities. Uh, we don't want these things imposed upon us. We aren't asking for them, but all these forces are telling us we need it. And so you see it in the cities, um, you know, and then you have these activists that'll show up at a city council meeting. They'll show up in their t-shirts and it'll look like, it'll give the illusion that all the citizens are for or against something. They show up in their t-shirts. So you think, oh, we've got a lot of people that are speaking on this. And then you come to find out they're paid activists. They show up to, you know, to sign up. They're, they're handed a script what to say. And then they, you know, push an agenda. And so the city council thinks, so well, these, this, you know, our, our people want this. It's all kind of preordained as well. So the, the, the average citizen is not necessarily showing up to these meetings and, and they, they may not want these things, but they're being pushed on, on their behalf. Um, you'll, you'll see, like with COVID, um, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are coming through because open government is not really happening right now and it really pisses me off because I can't show up to, now I can, I can show up to my school board meeting and the commissioner's court meeting and the city council meeting, but for a while there we could not. We were not getting the open records requests and so there was no open government and our Texas Education Agency uh, commissioner, Marath, is pushing through all kinds of, he's steering contracts, we've got grants coming in, we have... um, all of these uh, vendors and people that he's doing deals with, charters, it's, it's like the perfect opportunity for them to push through things because no one's paying attention. There's just very little transparency right now. We're in a crisis and they're capitalizing on that crisis. And, and they're making decisions. Oh, and then you talked about the CARES Act. I mean, even our commissioner's court. So our county judge was trying to use CARES money to hire two of his buddies, his campaign manager, former campaign manager and uh, this school board trustee who's always in the middle of the political scene for $76,000 a piece and that didn't go through proper procurement and so he you know just handing the money to his buddies well they we got wind of it and we we stopped it but it's very difficult to do I mean it takes a lot of work to to dig into these agendas and follow the money and who's behind this and it's like I mean you just never ends When there aren't that many people doing it, like what you do and what like Julianne does and what Mm -hmm. others do, there's just like, there's always just like one or two people that are like, no, this is bullshit. And then like they do something about it. But the overwhelming majority of people are just like, it's almost like they just. It's daunting. And they look, you're trying to feed your family. You're working a job. You're, I mean, you're exhausted. Uh, COVID's already stressful enough. And so, yeah, it takes, I mean, it takes a a unique, um, I guess, um, it's a, I don't, I'm not working a full-time job. So this is my job. I consider this, the, the following the money is like my, it's just what I do. It's like I was put on this earth to, to just follow the money. It takes a skill, but I, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's a unique perspective as, uh, uh, 
somebody who's following what's happening in the schools, who I follow the bills and the things going on at the state level and the national, you know, federal level, and then uh, the city stuff. So I, I think there are very few people who have the margin or even the drive to do it. And so when I find other people like me who, who see what I'm seeing, then we just instantly connect and we can share information. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes I wonder, you know, why, why do we even bother? Because the power and the money behind these, you know, these philanthropists and these philanthropic capitalists and these fake nonprofits and public-private partnerships that are all put into place to skirt transparency. I mean, they basically want to control the outcomes. And so, um, you know, there's way more money and, and power, but there's more of us. If you really think about like the people, if the people would truly understand what's going on, they could rise up. And like I tell this with the school district, the parents, I'm like, there's more of us than them. We're the taxpayers. They work for us. I don't understand why you're so, so afraid to buck the system. They work for us. And, I, and I'm not trying to impose my views on people. I'm just educating people on, like, well, here's what's happening. I mean, I'll sure, I'll give my opinion, but people can do whatever they want. I just want you to know this is what's happening. And a lot of times it's bipartisan. So I'm not, I'm not targeting one party or the other, really. I mean, I, I align with more conservative uh, views and values, but really my own party, which I've had to separate from, is doing a lot more of these predatory impact investing uh, bills, you know, like the, te the one I talked about before with the Texas Education Agency. That was a, a Republican senator who went on to now be a congressman, and his kids go to an elite private school in Dallas. He would never want investors to turn a profit on his kids' math scores at, you know, Hockaday. Uh, no, that would not be acceptable. But it's okay for our little poor, you know, public school kids. You know, my kids you can experiment with, and the kids that, uh, you know, are living in poverty, we can experiment with them, but no, not the private schools. So it, it's really, it's, it's disgusting that they get away with it. In addition to, it's also disturbing that uh, many of the people that are involved in this are actually looked up to um, you know, Bill Gates, there's, a, there's people and I've seen memes on, on online that are just like, imagine being a billionaire and spending your whole life trying to save the world and giving all your money away and then people attack you and, and it's just like, it's just ridiculous. I'm disgusted. I mean, it's like, if you look at all, I mean, talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, all these oligarchs are mostly, you know, white dudes supposedly smart white dudes. Well, he, you know, he dropped out of college. Um, you know, okay, so he started a, a successful, you know, tech company, software company. Uh, so what does that make? How, how does he know anything? With about, work, with other people's work. With other people's work. Yeah. How does that, why do I give a flip what he cares about in education? They all just and healthcare. They're so arrogant and healthcare and, and financial and systems, and everything. And yeah. Seeds and, Right. So I'm, I, I have, I'm not impressed. And, and it, we even have, you know, I told you about that commit partnership and the public private partnerships and the nonprofits and all of that. Well, so commit, they had this round table deal and you've got all these people at the table and it's, it's all these local, um, you know, a lot of rich people that, um, do a lot in Dallas and they, you know, it looks like noble causes, preschool, you know, pre-K, early childhood, or you'll have people that are um, working with the Dallas Regional Chamber. The chambers are always involved in this. They've got to get the business dudes behind these things to push them through to get the, the business influence. But um, one, one person at the table was Steve Ballmer. Well, Steve Ballmer is a former CEO of Microsoft. And he comes to town and he's getting all involved in, our, in education and he's investing in, in this collective impact in this this nonprofit that I told you was run by a former Goldman Sachs um, real estate guy. And so, you know, he gets frustrated with me because he thinks that I think that he's making money off of this deal. And I'm like, I, I know you already have money. I, I, it's, I, I didn't even, that's, it's not about that. It's that 
this he's creating this education ecosystem that co-ops the the school board he stacks the school board he, he co-ops everything so he's influencing legislation at the at the state level all of our education bills this huge you know um, house bill three which was supposed to be like everyone's singing its praises all across the state and just going to save us you know fund our schools finally oh yeah he's the hero well, I know all of it's unsustainable, and now we're going into a crisis with the budget and COVID and all of that. But um, part of the bill was uh, for pre-K, and the other part was for teacher merit pay. So they tie everything to test scores. Um, a lot of it feeds into this impact investing uh, that I was talking about earlier. And um, they're really big into pre-K because the earlier you can access children, the bigger the return on the investment. So you can get, you know, 13% return or so, maybe 10 to 13% return. So the investors put the money in and then they can measure the hell out of the kids, like track them to death. Every single move they make can be tracked on the device. Um, and they're doing this in pre-K all the way through graduation, this cradle to career, womb to tomb, workforce uh, that they're trying to track and sort children and decide who's going into STEM and who's going to college and who's going you know, into trades. Like they will pre, I mean, all these kids will be, it's like, you know, predictive analytics on these babies and their brains, you know, how they can, they can um, determine, you know, the growth and, and their development. And it sounds good because you think, well, you know, whatever happens in that zero to five space is so important. What happens with the brain development? And you have to, to stimulate a child's brain and their, um, they, they have to be, uh, you know, they have to be read to and they have to be um, engaged with and you need to talk to them and the way that they develop their words. All of those things are important for brain development. So I don't disagree with that. And I don't have an issue with preschool. Uh, my kids went to pre-K pre two days a week. Uh, but what they're, we're talking about is uh, an impact investing scheme. It's a pay for success model where investors put the money in and they want to know how the kids are doing at the end of the, the deal. And they they get a return, a financial return. And also like the, the idea of just privacy um, you know, do, do children deserve to have any privacy or, or are they just da little data points? And, you mm -hmm. know, well, they're reducing the students and the teachers to data points. And that's why I fight this whole data driven model of education and data walls and everything being driven by data. I mean, they actually have books that these teachers are supposed to read driven by data. Well, I, and um, I pointed this out during my school board race. I was like, data, data, data. Ever since we started obsessing on this data, our outcomes are actually worse. Our scores are declining. Our reading and math scores are worse. Our kids are doing worse. And so I think when you reduce them to data points, that's necessary for the impact in investing model, but it's not good for children, like what we know children. I mean. We already know how children learn. We already know what's best for kids. All these time-tested models, you can't make money on them. So old reading strategies, there's no profit there. Old reading strategies, you can't track the shit out of, I mean, sorry, but you can't track the hell out of the kids. Um, and you know, every click, every move they make, every activity, every, um, you know, they can even track their engagement and their, there are sensors you can put in, this, in their shoes and these sensory play tables that they're creating with the preschool children. The, every single move can be tracked and they have actually have a preschool in Dallas ISD and the, like they have these data binders for preschool, like what the heck. Um, and so uh, when you reduce them to data points, then, uh, you know, they can be controlled and you can manipulate and um, nudge, um, that's what they want because really if you can't track them, then how can you control them? And their development is, is limited to how they can contribute to the economy mm -hmm. as opposed to how they can develop as a, as a full human being. And, yes. and I know that Klaus Schwab talks about changing what it means to be human. Right, these are transhumanists and 
Uh, those, those are things that most people don't even know what that is. They don't even know who Klaus Schwab is and, and the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset. That You can go on, on YouTube and there are videos about the Great Reset. We are living through the Great Reset and COVID is the perfect catalyst for the Great Reset. And in that, in their reset, I believe what happens is we all have, we are all going to be tracked, you know, the, most likely through our devices or our phones initially, but down the road, it could be some sort of, you know, chip in your skin or whatever. Um, you know, we're gonna have to accept the, the, the vaccine for the virus. We're going to have to, uh, everything we do, whether we travel or whether we um, go to school, it will all be determined if we are, if we have the antibodies, if we've got the digital immunity passport, if we are safe, or we, if we're deemed safe to go back to work or go back to school in this, um, this whole, you know, new world normal that they've created. And um, so that feeds into the smart cities and the, uh, the Internet of Things and all of that feeds into the Great Reset. I don't I don't really do a whole lot of studying on that. I just know it's real and that that they um, this is the perfect opportunity under the pandemic in order to usher in the Great Reset. So it's not conspiracy theory. I mean, people would be like, that sounds tinfoil hat. It's out there. I don't I don't make this shit up. Well, another thing that's been interesting for me, at least this year, is, um, you know, my activism or whatever, you know, lack of a better word. Um, my focus has been on human rights, environmental issues and um, economics as well, because mm -hmm. that ties into all of that. And 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 kind of the the people that I've 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 worked with and around have been more kind of on the liberal side of the spectrum. Um, but this is kind of like redrawing the lines. It's it's like. A lot of the people are, you know, that I'm connecting with are a little bit more conservative. And, and I've always felt that, that if you really get down to talking about issues, um, these these categories that have been created are not really helpful. They, they put people, they pigeonhole people into when, when oh, yeah. actually people are more complex than that. And and it, but it, but the categories also prevent this 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 dialogue that needs to happen from people that, that have maybe a little bit different understanding of the world. Well, I, I think uh, you and I've talked about how it does feel like this is, uh, there, this is kind of, an, it's an evil system that is being ushered in. And so I look at it as a spiritual battle. I think you've got different, um, different things coming at us from, from different perspectives. And it's like, uh, all these wicked things are really about controlling us and controlling outcomes and manipulating us um, and in using the crisis and the virus as a way to, to really double down on controlling us. And so people who understand this global impact investing market, this human capital bond market that we're, that we're experiencing in the social impact bonds, but also the, um, you know, with the Great Reset that I was talking about, um, all of it is really to control where we go, what we do, how we spend our money, how we eat, how we sleep, how we are educated. Um, and so, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I would say I, I'm a free market conservative, uh, but, and, and, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now about capitalism and, and anti-capitalism or, you know, the, the greedy capitalists. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I, one thing I didn't mention is that I work with unemployed people and I have been doing that for 10 years. So I volunteer with a, a church ministry and, and I help people. Since I used to do recruiting, it's, it was a natural place for me to serve. And um, so I help them with resumes and networking and the whole job, anything surrounding the job search. And, and just seeing how this has impacted people and their ability to work. It's shut down their livelihoods and it's, and, and it's difficult to even know where to send them because I think that what's happening under this, this transformation that we're witnessing in this new world normal is that the, the future of work 
we've heard the this discussion about the future of work. I've heard it at the chambers of commerce. I've heard it in our schools. All this about the future of work. Well, now it's like they've been talking about this stuff, like robots are going to replace us, and 60% of the jobs of the future don't even exist now, and we're going to have to, you know, educate the workforce of tomorrow and all this stuff about the future. Well, the future of work now is being ushered in. And so what's going to happen in this automated society and in, in this uh, when you've got robots, you know, replacing people, um, then you've got a lot of people who have nothing to do. And so what does that look like? Um, so I'm deeply concerned about those who are trying to push a future on us that we don't necessarily want and we don't have to accept. But we are, I mean, it's, it's, it's like we, we're losing our freedoms. And, you know, I was talking about not, not only the, the free market, but um, the just, I, I'm a free bird. I don't want people telling me what to do. I don't like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I can follow the rules, you know, the, and I'm a law-abiding citizen, but I think what's being forced upon us is an infringement on our rights as free Americans. And there, there's a reason why people come to our country to escape the tyranny and the, the you know all these socialist societies or these communist countries that they come to America for the you know land of opportunity and the the freedoms that we have and and I think the left and the right get caught up in those arguments I think what we're really battling is technocracy and I don't think any of that matters because the technocrats and those who are trying to impose all these things that we don't want either through nonprofits, public private partnerships and such, all of those are to circumvent our elected bodies. They don't want to deal with that. They just want to impose what they want to impose. And so in this technocratic rule, which you know if Google and Facebook and, and you know Zuckerberg and Gates and all of them are and, and um, Bezos, all of them are making the decisions for us. We don't even need our elected bodies because we're not we're not even going through them anywhere. They're doing this crap through the back door. And that's, that's happening in our cities, our school districts, and, and our, in our government. And even when I go to the legislature, like I'll go to the, the House and the Senate and testify, I'm at the end of the day, I get my two minutes, and these, these you know, bottom feeders are all in the audience, and they get, they're, they're stacked in the testimonies all throughout the day. They get much more time than I do as a taxpayer and you know, lowly citizen. And, and so they get bumped to the front of the line. That happens everywhere. And it, it, it is largely theater. I mean, at the it's end of the day, total political theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and they they are all kind of working behind the scenes, undermining the, the little taxpayer. And but what I was going to say about the technocracy is that we don't really have, uh, you know, we, we, I think you and I were talking earlier about borders and things. There was a video my kids were watching. One of my kids um, had to watch in school. It was a YouTube video and a guy talking about borderless nations and and. Um, and just being, you know, that he was a, pro a proponent of not having borders. Well, if you don't have a border, you don't have a country. Uh, but borders really won't even matter in this technocratic rule because we will be reduced to these, these uh, it's like geofencing. They're invisible borders. We will not be allowed to go outside of our little spot. And so all this push for us to be a smart city and, and shop local and live local and walk everywhere, all this walkability, a lot of that is designed to keep us, you will basically, wherever in the Great Reset, you wherever you are, that's where you're stuck and you won't necessarily be able to travel or shop or you know buy and sell and trade unless you have, unless you have accepted the terms, which could be the mandatory vaccines, the uh, digital immunity passports, and, and being able to prove that you are healthy in this, um, you know, this pandemic. And that's, I mean, we know that this could come because we've seen these trial runs and, and these uh, predictions and, and what do you call it? When they talk about it too. I mean, it's not. Yeah. I don't make this it's, stuff up. It's, it's, it's out in the open, but it's not re reported on. Yeah, they're not going to hear it on the news. They're not going to tell you, oh, this is, they, they don't, the news just kind of repeats, they regurgitate stuff. It's like they're kind of spoon fed things. I mean, really, we have to be the news. We have to write our own truth, the truth that's happening. We have to expose it. It's really more of a grassroots kind of um, um, effort that's going to stop this stuff. The more people we can notify and alert, but the masses, I mean, people are just so asleep. They're just like, wear your mask. What's the big deal? 
Just wear your mask. So, you know, most of the Put people, in, most, the <laughs> most of the people in my community, um, are, are, are like that, that are just, yeah. you know, you need to put your mask on because mm-hmm. you, you know, and they're, they're coming at it from, you know, a place of caring, you know, they, they want to protect lives. They, they really believe that people are, mm-hmm. you know, they believe that it's as bad as they say it is. Um, although I try to show them other, other evidence that it's not as bad as the media is making it out to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then, you know, trying to have a conversation about it without talking about these other things that are going on, I think is just um, useless because you can't, the, the, the context is missing. Yeah, it's the, it's the false dilemma fallacy. If you don't want to wear a mask, you must want to kill grandma and you must hate people. You must not care about people and death and dying. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Why would I do what I do working with unemployed people if I didn't care about people? Why would I advocate on my own time for public school children when my, my kids are fine now? I mean, I've, I was able to remediate my son who was struggling with the whole testing nonsense. I had to put him in a private school for two years to get him back up to speed from the learning loss. Um, yeah, I mean, this isn't about my kids necessarily, uh, a lot of the work I do. But um, yeah, regarding COVID, of course I care. My 98 year old grandmother is like, let me out. Let me go get my hair done. Let me go to Target and get my groceries. Now, you know, she has to rely on everyone to do it for her and she's not allowed out of her retirement facility. She's been in total lockdown and the cognitive decline, the isolation, uh, you know, all that we're finding our elderly are completely falling apart. They're shutting down, they're dying of loneliness. You can die of loneliness and um, you know, our kids have the learning loss that we had a suicide in our junior high. No one's counting the other curve. The other curve is isolation, suicide, uh, homelessness, eviction. All of those things are going up, but we're only looking at the COVID numbers, which we're now increasing the testing. We're jacking up. It's a case demic in Dallas. I mean, the more people they can get to test, the better, because then they can jack up those COVID And the tests numbers. Are, are like ridiculously is, flawed. Right. And so it's like, you know, well, we're going to follow the science, so we're going to follow the data. But whose data? Who? Which scientists? We can't even agree on that. Science is never settled. But they're using that in order to shut down the schools. And so we finally got the schools open, but the kids wear a plexiglass shield. They wear a mask. They can't hear the teacher because there's three shields in front of them because all the kids have shields on their desks. And we spent, you know, thousands of dollars on these stupid shields. And the kids are living in the, and they even sit at library time to sit on the floor. The little ones sit inside their little plastic cube. And uh, we don't really know what kind of damage we're doing as far as um, social development and, and just the trauma of all of it with the kids. People will say kids are resilient. Yeah, they're resilient. And then when they're 40, they're totally, you know, all this stuff comes out and they're, you know, falling apart. So kids may be resilient and then the things show up later in life. We have no idea what kind of damage we're doing to our kids. And also too, like when you study the World Economic Forum, it's pretty clear that these measures, and they even say that these these security measures are, that we're going to have to keep them in place. You know, mm-hmm. like people think that, oh, we're just going to get over this and then next year everything's going to be back to normal and everything will be fine. Yeah, that's the most ignorant thing because beca- we're not going back to normal unless we demand that we go back to normal. And I think most people are willing to lay down. They're like, just wear the mask. Well, the thing about the mask is that isn't even proven. I mean, the CDC changes it every you know couple of weeks. You'll hear something new from the CDC. And, and then, um, you know, as far as like the, the statistics of how many people have died, we're talking a 99.89% recovery rate. Um, our hospitals, you know, our COVID units have been closed, but now they're trying to say we're in code red right now. We've got a red, you know, we've got a color chart that this county, this runaway judge um, uses when you know, he's consulting with his health officials. And um, his color color chart is is at red now again. Uh, I, I'm not sure what kind of data he's using, but he's he's saying that the hospitals are now increasing in numbers, but they're not increasing in COVID patients. Yes, the hospitals are seeing more patients, but they're not COVID. But no one checks him on that, so he can say whatever he wants, and everybody gets all in a tizzy. The teachers, like my son was saying. His teacher was like, oh, the COVID numbers are going up. I mean, she's behind. You can't even understand her because she's behind a shield. So he's in-person learning. He went back to school weeks ago for in-person learning, but he has to log on virtually so he can hear her back like what he was doing at home when he was in virtual 
learning. So it's just, it's, it's a world gone mad. The protocols at the schools are so crazy. And you have the parents, there's this, there's this divide between the parents. You've got the parents who are like, this is harming our children. And then you have the parents who are like, if they could put two masks on their children, they would because they're so afraid. I saw people in hazmat suits coming to vote the election polls last week. Somebody had like one of those masks that you would wear if you were like, you know, spraying fumes or something. They had that and I watched them strip off the whole hazmat suit and wad it up in a trash bag and put it in the back of their car to go vote because they're terrified because of people like Clay Jenkins in Dallas, the runaway judge who's telling them, wear your mask, don't go out, don't do anything, live in fear. And then, and, and, you know, they're, they believe him. They trust the science, the science says. When the code thing, I mean, I remember them doing that with uh, 9-11, the terrorism, you know, we, we were at Ernie and now we're at Bert and, and now we're at Elmo. No, Red. I know the it's colors. crazy. Well, yeah, the colors. Well, funny you say Ernie and Bert because I, I kind of doctored a little thing. It was like the the judge and then his this doctor that used to be with the CDC who's like his health. He's the head of the Health and Human Services in Dallas. He hasn't been with a patient in who knows how long, but he's our supposed expert. And it, the, there's a picture of them. You know, he's got Bert and Ernie and then you've got the judge and the doctor next to each other because it's like they're puppets. They just, they're just regurgita regurgitating this stuff. It's the same thing you know, going on in California, Governor Newsom. You've got these, these, these politicians, they are intoxicated. They're drunk with power and they're, they don't want COVID to go away because then you've got people who are gonna ignore, they're just gonna go back to being a normal judge you know, where nobody cared and paid attention to them. And they're controlling our every, all of our freedoms are hinging upon their decisions, their whims for the day. And, I, you know, I don't know what to tell my job seekers. I'm just, you know, it's like, okay, well, there are some essential worker jobs open. And we're starting to see some jobs open in certain industries and areas. But it's really, it's really rough out there. I mean, it's demoralizing. It's uh, depressing. They're panicked. They don't know how they're going to make their rent. They don't really know how to market themselves. Some of them are having to change industries altogether and try and predict what's, what kind of industries are going to flourish in this new economy. And um, it makes me angry because I think much of it is unnecessary. We're creating more problems that, and these unintended consequences. But the fear porn is working. I mean, people are terrified. And, you know, we, you mentioned about, you know, earlier, I was thinking there are a lot of words that are thrown at me like empathy and just show kindness and just wear the mask. It's for, it's for you to show how much you care about others and you want to protect them. Well, if the mask, I mean, that's on you. That it's, I, I don't have COVID. And if I do have COVID, then... You know, I'm not going to be going out when I'm, we've got symptoms and there's this, this myth that you're an asymptomatic spreader and you're just spreading COVID everywhere that I don't believe that. And so you wear a mask to protect you. If I'm going to be around, I mean, there are certain circumstances where, of course, you know, I know I have to wear it on a plane. I mean, I have no choice. But, um, you know, I just think this, this submission that's happening with the masks is very dangerous. I think it's a symbol more than it is a protective measure. And people touch their masks all the time. They're constantly touching them and getting, and, you know, they'll tell you, like, get up in your face to tell you you need to put a mask on. And it's like, okay, well, what happened? It used to be six feet or a mask. Now it's like six feet and a mask, but they get all up in your face to tell you you need to wear a mask. It's just... It, to me, it's it's more of a muzzle than anything. I don't think it's going, and I don't think it does what people say it does. And even on the box, it says it doesn't do what it's supposed to And it's to also n normalizing um, meanness and discrimination, you know, because at the end of the day, I think, there it goes, end of the day. But, um, you know, you, I think it's going to be increased more and more. You know, you're not going to be able to go out. You're not going to be able to go into the store as as this becomes just a normal part of life and people right. don't don't push back and i think that's pretty scary you know the i've already kind of you know accepted the the, the very real possibility that in the future i may not be able to travel and i may i may need to like have someone go to the grocery store for me if this if this ends up going from oh you can't go come in mm -hmm. without a mask to you can't come in without your vaccine shot 
Um, and if you put your foot down and resist it, then, well, I mean, well, I'll tell you what happened to me. I was working, I signed up to be an election poll worker with the county, Dallas County. And I was working, I worked last week on Tuesday and Wednesday. And I tried to wear a mask, uh, you know, tried to comply. And I, you know, I, I was moving around the first day I wore it. And then the second day I learned that we don't have to wear it based on the governor's executive order. Poll workers and um, voters do not have to wear it according to his executive order. So I wore it about half the day and I kept, I mean, I had to take breaths. I, I would get lightheaded and by the end of the day, I had confirmation that we did not have to wear it. And so I quit wearing it. And the election judge told us we had to leave our shift 15 minutes early. And so then I showed up for my third shift, which was on Saturday, and they tried to have us arrested for not wearing our masks when we were well within the law. And then of course they got up all in our face to tell us to wear the mask because you're gonna spread your germs, you know? And I'm like, well, get back because I would never be in your space like that. If you're so afraid of me giving you COVID, why are you all up in my, if you're so afraid of me giving you COVID, why are you all up in my grill? And so she, um, she's like, well, you're spreading your germs everywhere. I'm like, I'm touching their driver's license. They hand it to me, I hand it back. There's germs everywhere. Their germs have been everywhere, you know, all along. And you have this false sense of security that this mask is going to protect you from germs and it's just you know and the masks um you know beyond that it's really not a, a battle of the masks it's really about submission control conformity and um like i said like a muzzle and what it shows our children i think it's just so harmful it's and and people say well they, may, well, they wear them in china all the time they totally wear them all the time I'm like yeah do you want to be like china do you want to wear a mask everywhere do you want to be in a, a surveillance state where you know you have your your Chinese social credit scoring and, and if you want to buy, sell, and trade, you have to, to you know show that you're a good little citizen? That's not what I want. That's not the kind of future that I want for my children. And and I know that there's a lot of um, there are a lot of things that we agree to. You know, as uh, you know, if you use an app, you agree to their conditions, or if you agree to to use, uh, you know, certain technologies. But um, I think that there's a lot of, there are a lot of assumptions made by these companies that they have, they can rightfully take and, and use your data and, and sell it and, and all. And it's very difficult to, to protect yourself from that. And I'm not paranoid about this stuff. I mean, I, I it's really more that I think uh, that, I know how the technology works. They can piece things together in the future and predictive, you know, they can profile our children. So I don't know, they may not be doing it now, but it, it's, we're, we're on the precipice of some really dangerous things that you know we see in the movies and now they're all coming to fruition. And I think we should be sounding the alarms about it. I think that um, it's dangerous. Yeah, it's kind of unreal. <laughs> yeah, it's surreal. Surreal. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have, so you have a lawsuit, correct? Yes, yeah, so we filed a lawsuit this week, and it's a class action, uh, and we should have a, an answer pretty quickly through the courts. But and what's the lawsuit say? So the lawsuit is basically that a political subdivision. So our local county judge and the, the Dallas County does not supersede the governor's executive order because they do, even though it's a, you know, the, the, the decisions are made at the local level, when you're talking about an election, that's something that's happening on the state and um, national level. So the 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 county reports to ultimately they're they're reporting to the secretary of state, and the secretary secretary of state is appointed by the governor, who also has this executive order. So uh, the these political subdivisions do not they cannot flout. I mean, they don't have the authority to make their own rules that, that that supersede the governor. I've also wanted, and I, I don't know the, the law around this, but even what, what rights the governors are have, you know, it just, it seems like there's an overextension of, I mean, Colorado, the governor mm -hmm. in Colorado has been very hard on, on the lockdowns yes. and the, and, mm -hmm. and the masks. And, and I just, mm -hmm. I, it's interesting because your lawsuit is actually doing the reverse where someone could make 
the argument that even the government, the governor doesn't have the right to just declare laws, but I don't know how, you know, Well, I mean, he's got a mask work, mandate you know, on the whole the state. That would solve the problem right there. The governor should just lift the mask mandate, open the state, let us be adults about this, and we'll decide what's safe for us and what's not. And, and you know, that, that brings up a whole other issue, like, you know, with these businesses is that, you know, like my my husband's company was already setting up all kinds of protocols that would have made the guests very safe. And they were going to do that before the lock lockdowns even happened. But they weren't given the freedom to do that as independent businesses. And they know that, I mean, anybody can post anything on social media if they thought that the place wasn't being clean or, or you know, keeping the guests safe and all that. But ne we were never given the opportunity to even do that as a state or a city. And so it removes the freedom and the, you know, these businesses are completely, you know, they pick and choose the winners and losers and they decide who's essential, who's not essential. All jobs are essential. All workers are essential, but they can still say, okay, well, you know, the Walmart is safe, but then this, you know, this business that's, you know, out One essential to who? Because an income is essential to everyone. Absolutely. That's why I say they're all essential. And so they're playing God with who succeeds and who survives. All these businesses are shut for good. I mean, you have long standing these institutions, these icons, these restaurants and companies that can't survive this. The PPP funds only go so far. And that's just a, that's like, that's like a band aid. It's, they're not going to make it. And so I think they're devastating, uh, you know, it's, it has a devastating impact on our our cities and our state. And so the governor could totally solve this in one fell swoop, just open. But I don't think that's, I think the reason, he's a, he's a Republican governor, it doesn't matter. He's no different than a Democrat governor at this point because the, the what he's doing, he's stalling us because I do believe that he's stalling us for a vaccine and he's going to try and be the hero and, and but he's going to try and control us and our ability to go back to work, school and, and, and to sporting events and things. He's, go, he's going to use the, the vaccine to control us. Unfortunately, I think he's sold out to that. I mean, he's got this, this strike force to open the state that he established months ago. And on that strike force, the COO, the head of the strike force to open Texas is a former Merck. Um, he's a, a super lobbyist for the, the pharmaceutical industry. So I can see the writing on the wall. I know what they're doing. And I, I just think that our, our battle is not as much a right left battle as it is um, mm -hmm. a top down. It's, you know, it's money and power versus the people at the end of the day. And right. I think we need to reexamine how we approach this because the, the whole the way we've been divided is is it's it's dysfunctional. The power and the money. The money and the power. The money and the, the power. power. <laughs> <laughs> minute after hour minute, up, hour after hour. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, it's, yeah, it's no paradise though. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's bad. And, and, um, and I don't think money motivates the governor. I think it's, it's just like most politicians. It ends up being power. It starts out, maybe it's money and, and influence and all that. It's the power. What even the billionaires, like how much money, what are, you, are we going to buy another yacht that you're not going to use? Like it is about power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And policy is really a, a, a tool that's, they can imp implement or they can, um, influence policy and they can impact policy policies where it's at you got all these policy wonks and those things turn into bills and you've got alec you know uh, american legislative exchange council and they will do these cut and paste bills and verbatim you'll see the bills roll out and some legislator thinks he's the hero oh look i've got this bill we're going to call it the such and such bill and you think oh you think he came up with it no that thing rolled down from the top somewhere and it's it's a it's like this machine. It's like this, these gears that are being locked in place, and we're just watching it all just. Well, that's why I tell people that get so wrapped up in the in the political theater, is that yeah. you know these people are not really in charge. They don't they don't write the legislation, and they often don't even read the legislation. <sighs> it's, it's it's a puppet gross. show. Yeah, watching like watching Van Taylor, who's now a congressman, but he was the one that did that social impact bond bill. He's like. And so the innovation zones will be created and they will, I mean, he doesn't even know what the hell he's pushing on our kids. And then you got the commissioner and they're all like giggling and chummy and it's so cute how they just adore each other and they're, 
oh, I can't think of anyone better to pitch this bill than the great commissioner. And it, it's, you know, I said it before, it's a bipartisan. So, you know, I get, I get attacked for being, you know, too conservative or get attacked for being too liberal because I align with this or this, you know, because I support public education, I must be a liberal and I support, you know, um, something else. I must be a conservative. Oh, I must be a Trumper. You know, they just, you know, the labels are, are it's exhausting. Mindless. It is. And I, you know, if you really, if you start getting mired in the party politics, I'm out because I, I, I mean, I, I am able to see, I mean, it's not that I don't, um, uh, subscribe to you know certain things i mean i i i had i got kicked out by a republican and a democrat judge in the election uh poll uh, at the precinct because they were both trying to enforce this mask it was like a power struggle and you know that people don't want to come to my my table then go to another one who's wearing a mask we have a plexiglass shield up they're wearing a mask most likely and it's just the whole thing is just stupid there's no science involved I'm, and it's such I'm, a farce. I mean, you're at the restaurant, you're going to walk 10 yeah. feet and then take your, I mean, it's so stupid. If we would all just start pushing the envelope, I mean, I go into places as long as I can, get, as much as I can get away with it, I will not wear it. I've been, I've walked into to restaurants and I'll go straight to the patio and then it's like, well, it's too late to bust me. I've already done it. Or I always take it off when I'm leaving because I can't kick you out if you're already leaving. Anytime we can we can remove that mask, um, I think is important for us to resist it because it is not protecting people like they say it is. And if you're vulnerable, that I'm sorry, but it, it's on it's on you. And I certainly don't want to get in your personal space if I did have any kind of you know virus or I'm not going to get in your personal space anyway. That's not how I am. Uh, but I'm shocked at how many people to to tell you you need to wear your mask. They get all up in your face. You see these videos, these confrontations. It's like they're not afraid of COVID. They want to they want to tell you what to do and they want to enforce it. And and this whole thing was started on these um, the, these models, you know, these models like the the models that were created about the number of deaths that they expected to happen. Oh like yeah, in the millions. Which no were one ever just, holds them to their which wrong were completely numbers. absurd, and they're doing the exact same thing again. Now there's the, the, there's just a guy on the mm-hmm. t- t- the other day saying, oh, there's going to be this this next wave is going to have millions of deaths, and it's just like nobody questions these people, and it's it's really disturbing. Oh yeah, we have a, a poster, a picture of the local Dr. Huang, you know, doing his his chart saying this is how many people are going to die. We're all going to die, and that chart is so far off. It was like what, it was like four hundred thousand. I don't know, something crazy, like four hundred thousand or two hundred thousand. I mean, the predicted deaths, and you know, they counted everything as COVID. I mean, everything was counted as COVID. We know that we have people who asked for a, they asked for an autopsy done on their loved ones because they're like, I don't think they died of COVID. They were counting everything as COVID. And so that can't be disputed. We know that was happening. And how do you prove that? Yeah. You know, the, and then the, also the demonization of, of people, you know, like the pitting of, of everyone against one another, you know, like oh, yeah. this, you know, like even kids, like they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're taking these young kids that are just hanging out and they're like, you're responsible for death. You know, it's, it's really sick. You're going to kill grandma. These kids are terrified. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day and the, their son forgot their mask and went to school. And then I guess the school ended up giving him a mask, but he was all worried that he was going to come home and infect grandma. And he's, they're like, no, honey, it's okay. With that little amount of time, like he was so worried he was going to infect the grandma. I mean, we've got, we have no idea what these anxieties and, um, and the long-term effects of you know, what we're doing to the kids. I think we're going to see all kinds of disorders like OCD and, and um, tics and, and stuttering and just things that, from trauma that are going and to And I also show. wonder about like ch- young children at the, that developmental age, you know, what, what this is going to do to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, the, we were already seeing an uptick in those things with kids and all kinds of mental health issues. This is going to just catapult them. And, and, and you know, um, the one thing we haven't covered is just what I've learned from Allison is that these systems were broken. A lot of the systems were broken on purpose. And a lot of these, uh, you'll hear a lot about trauma-informed education and uh, people understanding trauma. Or uh, you'll have... Um, 
social emotional learning in the schools, a lot of these things you'll see they, they the impact investing schemes they capitalize on or they 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 run on poverty and suffering and, and all kinds of the social ills are necessary for the impact investing market. So whether it's homelessness or uh, some sort of mental health issues or uh, you know anything any kind of social ill can be turned into an impact investing scheme or a pay for success model. And so all of this chaos and all the 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 fallout of the COVID, um, you know, the just I guess all the side effects of that actually feed the impact investing market. So they would actually get more of a return the more the suffering that's happening. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. But even the medical Poverty. field, it's like you 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 know you you make money off of sickness, and so true. So why would you talk about wellness? Well, in our health department, they keep talking about wash your hands. Uh, wear a mask and social distance. What the hell does that have to do with health? And, and, you know, that's just a, those are like preventive measures. What about telling people vitamin D and take care of yourself and get out in the sunshine. Don't be afraid and hole up in your house. You need to get out and move and do things. And that those are things that actually boost your immune system, but they don't talk about those things. And I think people, the, one, the really frustrating thing is we finally had doctors coming out and speaking up saying, okay, it's not necessarily a death sentence. They were putting people in the hospital with COVID and they were smothering them with ventilators and the, par the, the parents, or, the, or not the parents, but the families couldn't advocate for them. You're not allowed in the hospital to even do that. And so you had people dying alone, dying with the wrong treatment. So now you've got doctors coming out and saying, you need antibiotics, you need a... a a, um, you know, uh, you need zinc and you need some sort of steroid and then they're recovering from COVID. It's not even, they're not even necessarily saying the HCQ, which became some sort of political mess um, or controversy, you know, those who were promoting HCQ. So it's, uh, you know, it's become politicized, this, the treatment and to, to tell people how to be healthy and prevent COVID is not, that's not being talked about by our local health officials. They don't care what you're doing to, to protect yourself that way. They don't say a word about it. Yeah, there are these, these signs that just show the holes in, in the mm -hmm. holes in all of this. There's, there's a lot of holes. Um, what's Science. your, what do you, what do you, what are you hoping to see happen here in the next year? Oh, well, I just love to see a, a big revolution and a resistance and for people to, to push back on this, this new not normal. I, I think that we need to start demanding we do the right thing by our children. And uh, we certainly can take precautions. I don't want anybody to die of a virus. I don't want anybody to, you know, um, be in the hospital. I think um, if you're immunocompromised, then, you know, you can take your precautions, but the rest of us need to get back to work and get back to school and get our lives back going. And um, that will benefit the majority of our society to be able to live free and, and, um, and do what we need to do to take care of our families. And uh, I think we need less uh, surveillance and, and control of our citizens through all these, these uh, draconian measures. And you, you're this person that really is, you know, pushes back on, on a lot of things. And has, have you have you had a lot of fallout because of that? Well, when I ran for school board, yeah, I mean, it was a nasty campaign, but um, and it was really more just trolls and people and strange things. Um, and my website was hacked and like weird things like that. But um, I would say... Uh, you know, I, I use social media quite a bit to in, to engage with people and, and help them understand what's coming down the pike. I'll, you know, I put out a lot of predictions on what I see uh, or I, I study patterns, behaviors and what's happening in the legislature. I mean, the 7,000 bills, uh, more than half were education bills. So I just I put a lot of stuff out there. I use Twitter. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very aggressive tweeter. And I like uh, Twitter just because it's instant. Um, I use Facebook and I use, uh, you know, other other tools like Vimeo for my videos or YouTube. 
but um, no, I mean, I would say um, not too much. I mean, you have the you have mean you know people who get nasty and, and try and make things political, or they'll say you know you want to kill grandma. You must not care about people. Like I said, the false dilemma fallacy. It's like if you don't want to wear a mask, you must want people to die, and that's just not that that's not the case. And I do have empathy. I really truly care about what happens to people. I don't ever want to see people suffer. And I think um, you know, COVID suffering is not any more important than, you know, keeping people from, pe people from suffering from something else. I mean, suffering is suffering and I know there's varying levels, but I think um, for a virus that has such a high success rate, we should be looking at the suffering that's happening as a result of shutting down our, our livelihoods and our economy and our, our everything, shutting down life. It's not, it's not realistic, nor is it healthy at all. It's very harmful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think most people, they don't necessarily understand all the big picture stuff. And I'd like to make that more accessible to people. Uh, but I mean, if it's just having just basic conversations about masks and our, our freedoms, then I, I'll do that. But I understand there's much bigger picture here. You know, I, I, I told this to my daughter because she was put in quarantine even though she wasn't sick and she didn't have COVID and she didn't even get tested. Put it in quarantine for 14 days while her, the roommate who was tested and was sick, or was tested, uh, she was 10 days. And so I told her, I said, quarantine is when you restrict the movement of the sick. Tyranny is when you restrict the movement of the healthy. And that's exactly what's happening here. And she's like, I get it. I get it why you fight so hard. Because she has, all of her freedoms were stripped from her. She couldn't go anywhere. I mean, she had to quarantine. And she's, she's no, nothing's wrong with her. And then no one's in the hospital in College Station, Texas. I mean, zero COVID patients, and yet the whole school's freaking out. All these kids go back to college, and they're testing positive, but no one's really sick. Or if they are, they're sick for a few days, they're fine. And so this is just all for naught. I mean, it's just stupid. And seeing this as a tool, looking through history, this is something very unique in the ability that they'll have to control people and, and like the, everything from geofencing, we're going to lock down a neighborhood. There's a protest going on. Oh, the tests, oh, the tests are saying there's COVID going on. People think that that couldn't happen or doesn't happen. But all you have to do is look at what kind of people these people are that you that they put out on the media. Um, yeah, they'll show you exactly who they are and you need to believe them. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, it's a pivotal moment. And yeah, I mean, you look at these dictators and they used a crisis in order to gain more power. When you give them more power, they don't give it back. I mean, they, they're going to double down. They want more, it only grows. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing people like Gavin Newsom and he's just intoxicated. And I said that before, and then Cuomo in New York, I mean, it is, it, it's, it's unreal. I mean, I really, I, I can't believe I mean, all those people he killed in the nursing home that he sent them back in there. And, and I mean, just, yeah, he's a and then he writes a book as if he's some hero. Look how wonderful I've handled this crisis and gag. I mean, these people are such narcissists. It's disgusting and they need to be called out. And, but yet people don't see it. It's like, that's, that's even more disturbing to me than I know they fixate them. on Trump. Trump is the, the sort, I mean, whether you like Trump or not, I mean, Trump didn't bring COVID. Trump didn't, hmm. you know, they'll criticize how these governors handled the, the shutdown. They should have done it sooner. I mean, none of that would have done anything to locking down sooner. No. And, you know, you can either, there's two ways of doing it. You can, you can let the, let it spike and then it goes away faster, or you can drag this out forever. And that's what we're doing. We're flattening the curve. We're dragging it out forever. It's never going to go away because I mean, it's though the people will say, Oh no, you can't do the herd immunity. Everybody will die and we'll fill up the hospitals and there won't be any ventilators. I think that's all manufactured the hospitals are not full. Well, also they, they keep changing the, um, the goalpost or they keep changing the, you know, the narrative. Yeah. Oh, so what's our goal? Is it zero? Zero deaths and zero cases? Well, then we will go on forever. It's never going to end. We'll just drag this out forever. And then they can really bring in even worse 
controls. Well, is there is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to to um, to go over? We we covered a lot. Oh yeah, I think we did. I mean, yeah, I think I think we're good. Well, I appreciate yeah. you giving me your time, and thank um, you. You know, I'm just going out wanting to have more conversations, and um, thank you for you know mm-hmm. standing up and speaking your mind. Yeah, and I appreciate you doing this because I think you're you're giving a wider reach, you know, for for the women who are speaking out on this. And I, I so appreciate. I learn from them, even though I already know so much about what they do. Just seeing the videos helps me to to really understand. You know, we all have different pieces of this that we understand more than the other. And I really do learn from them and appreciate this this um, band of you know, sisters, I guess. And brothers. <laughs> and brothers. Well, yes, of course. Our brother who's filming. But I mean, the, the, these women that you're showcasing, it's yeah. amazing to, to see what they've done. And we're all in different parts of the country, and yet we see the same thing happening. So yes, thank you. Appreciate your efforts. Excellent. Well, thank you. And until um, next time. Yeah. <laughs>